Our next speaker is Dr. Larissa Nekladov, who's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and a practicing internist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Primary Care Associates in Longwood. She's clinical director and internal medicine director for cancer survivors at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, offering clinical consultations for long-term cancer survivors at the David B. Perini Quality of Life Clinic and the Adult Survivorship Program. As co-director of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Continuing Medical Education Program on Cancer Survivorship, Dr. Nekladov is particularly interested in improving the care of cancer survivors and interplay between primary and oncology care. We are privileged to have her here. She's a wealth of information, and I apologize in advance that she's only going to be speaking for 15 minutes. Dr. Nekladov. introduction and um, you really deserve so much credit for pulling this off and getting this audience here to attend this uh, Cancer Survivorship 101 in Springfield, Massachusetts. So congratulations. <laughs> he's a man with a passion, so he's going to get it done. Um, so it's really an honor to uh, speak here today. And my topic is a very complicated topic and so clearly you're not going to walk away from this session today knowing everything that you may potentially be at risk for as a cancer survivor depending on your treatment and many of these late effects you may never get so this topic is something that I think would be helpful for everybody to at least know about so that when you are having these conversations with your oncologist or with your primary care provider, you're coming in with a little bit more information. So um, the objectives are you will understand the potential long-term and late effects of uh, cancer treatment, and I'm focusing on the physical effects. Be aware of how to monitor for such effects. Be able to discuss these effects with your providers and know which resources may be available to help manage these uh, late effects. So a few definitions. What are long-term effects? The long-term effects are effects that you might have um, developed during cancer treatment, and they last for months to years after treatment. The late effects are the effects that you never had. You completed your treatment and you had no side effects whatsoever specifically to that. And years later, it might be months, year, months later or years later, you may start developing some of these um, late effects. There are a number of mechanisms that, oh yes. <laughs> Hello. So there are a number of mechanisms that can lead to the development of, first, I actually just distracted my attention, sorry. So first I'm going to talk about how one cancer, having one cancer may lead to the development of another cancer, and that's one of the potential lay effects. And so there are a number of different ways in which people who might have had one cancer may at some point develop their another cancer. Um, there are many people, I'm sure, in this audience who have had more than one cancer. And so um, some of the ways is, um, okay, so some of the ways may be that whatever led you to get, get the first cancer in the first place, such as your lifestyle, so if you're a smoker and you had lung cancer, you may still be at risk for another smoking-related cancer, such as a head and neck cancer. 
Um, also, environment can have a role in um, making you more predisposed to have a second cancer. Other host factors like your age and sex and other factors. And then interactions and other influences like gene to gene environment. You know, you can have, for example, BRCA1 carriers. Not everyone is going to get breast cancer, right? It's somehow how the genetic makeup interacts with the environment and all sorts of other factors that may lead to somebody developing a breast cancer. For the focus of this presentation, I'm really going to um, discuss how the treatment for cancer one can lead to cancer two. So the ways um, the treatment can lead to the development of second cancer um, can be through chemotherapy. And typically, chemotherapy effects are early on, you know, within the first 10 years of treatment. So for example, somebody might be getting chemotherapy to treat their breast cancer. There is a potential risk that the chemotherapy may lead to a second cancer, such as leukemia, myelodysplastic um, syndrome, or other types of malignancies. You know, the same can be held true for some of the other uh, chemotherapy agents. But typically, chemotherapy, once about 10 years-ish is done, you should not really be at risk for second cancers related to the chemotherapy. On the other hand, there's radiation therapy. So typically, radiation therapy for the first 10 years or so doesn't predispose you, typically, to get another cancer. But radiation-related cancers can happen 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after radiation therapy. And so there are a number of factors that, um, that play a role here, which is the dose of radiation, the area that was treated, the age of treatment. And here, this is an important point about the age of treatment. So if you are a 70-year-old woman who has radiation therapy for breast cancer, chances are that radiation is not going to lead to a second cancer for you. Because unless you live to a ripe old age of 100 plus, chances are that's not going to be a, a major factor. On the other hand, if you were diagnosed at a young age, you know, as a teenager, and you had treatment that included radiation, you have many more decades of potential life ahead of you, and so unfortunately the risk of radiation-induced cancers are higher. Um, if, you're, um, if you have chemotherapy, chemotherapy plus radiation, that increases the risk. Smoking, so nobody in this audience at all should ever be a smoker ever. <laughs> If you, have, if you have not had cancer, you should not be a smoker. If you have had cancer, you should absolutely 100% never be a smoker. Um, and then, like I mentioned, years since uh, radiation therapy. So this is sort of like an easy schematic that, um, you know, that I like to teach, which is basically when it comes to radiation, what area was exposed to the radiation and whatever is under that area, that's potentially at risk for um, second cancers. So what in, that includes the skin, the underlying subcutaneous tissue, like all of the connective tissues, muscles, and then the underlying organs. So in terms of screening for second malignancies, that really depends on a whole bunch of factors, including your age, what kind of cancer, what kind of treatment, etc. So for example, for patients who have had um, Hodgkin lymphoma and had radiation to the chest wall, they're at risk for secondary breast cancers. And the risk is basically equivalent to being a BRCA mutation carrier. So those patients absolutely need to have mammograms at an early age. And so the recommendations vary in terms of when, but typically um, for those who were treated younger, 
it's 25 or eight years after completion of therapy. And certainly those who were treated later, even though, even though for the general population there is controversy about when to begin breast cancer screening, these patients absolutely should begin screening at age 40. Um, and often uh, they will also need to have an MRI done. So patients who have had radiation to their chest wall, you know, will need to discuss Am I at risk for breast cancer? What type of imaging do I need with the oncologist and with the primary care provider? Um, they may need, depending on the exposure, again, if you had chemotherapy and radiation therapy lower you know, in your abdomen, uh, may need an earlier colonoscopy. So not starting at age 50 as per current guidelines, um, we have not yet changed the guidelines to 45, as you may have heard from the American Cancer Society. Um, but these patients might even need an earlier colonoscopy, possibly starting at age 35. Um, consider lung cancer screening, um, again, because of the exposures um, and potential history of smoking. Absolutely skin examination, so radiation can lead to um, basal cell cancers and melanomas. So doing a careful examination of your skin if you've had radiation is important. Thyroid examination, again, if you've had radiation here. But essentially, the patients and the physicians need to be vigilant about symptoms. So if you had radiation to your chest wall and you're having um, GERD, right, so reflux, and you know the, your PCP keeps throwing Prilosec prescriptions, at some point you do need to think about, well, you know, I did have radiation to my chest wall and my esophagus is in my chest wall and it's been about 10 years since my treatment was completed. Should I consider whether we need to do something else, an endoscopy to take a look, make sure that there's nothing going on. So, um, brief overview of um, surgery. So, um, some of the potential effects might be lymphedema, so swelling in the lymph, um, because of the lymph nodes, pain, functional limitation, sexual dysfunction, and so I just want to make a, a, a shout out for sexual dysfunction. Don't be afraid to talk about sexual dysfunction with your providers. They will not ask you. They don't know how to talk about it. So you need to bring it up and mention it to them. Um, I see patients who are followed by gynecologic oncology and not a single person in gyn-onc asks them about their sex function. How is that possible? But it is. Um, body image, infertility, infections, if you've had your spleen removed, make sure you get your vaccinations. Um, ostomy for colon cancer. And so management for that is just early recognition, referral to physical therapy, behavioral therapy, and sex therapy. And so these are, again, just uh, lots of medical terms. You don't need to like worry about it or think about it. But essentially, again, if you've had radiation, just think about everything under in the field of the radiation and just talk to your provider. Am I at risk for anything? You might be just fine. Chances are you will be just fine. But at least have the information that you need. So chemotherapy, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, but essentially, there are some chemotherapy agents that are more likely to have some potential late effects. So um, for cardiac dysfunction, doxorubicin, also known as adriamycin, that's a drug that many patients get for breast cancer, um, that is uh, associated with cardiac dysfunction, um, as is trastuzumab, which is Herceptin. The difference is here, trastuzumab typically, when you get cardiac dysfunction, it occurs during treatment, whereas adriamycin might occur during treatment, but can also occur years after treatment. Um, pulmonary fibrosis, um, neuropathy with many of those um, agents, um, hearing loss and autotoxicity, complications to the bladder um, and the kidneys, and then early menopause and, and infertility. So again, you don't need to know this, but just know that there is the potential. Um, again, for hormonal therapy, so these are not so much late effects, these are basically side effects. And so tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, androgen deprivation for prostate cancer may be associated with potential side effects. 
that you need to at least be aware of and discuss with your um, providers. But then I also just kind of want to frame all of this in the greater context of life, medical life, which is basically chronic medical conditions. So something that's important to know is, yes, cancer survivors have more chronic medical conditions. What do I mean by chronic medical conditions? Diabetes, COPD, lung disease, hypertension, et cetera, um, than the general population. But all of, these, all of these other medical conditions are associated with the increased risk of cancer therapy cardiac effects. So what does that mean? Yes, these drugs can cause potential effects, but if you also have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, that increases your risk. So high uh, diabetes before cancer is associated with increased um, mortality. Um, you're also more likely to get peripheral neuropathy if you have diabetes. Um, but the important thing to know is that all of these other medical conditions oftentimes have a greater role in your overall mortality. So, um, so here is a graphic um, that basically looked at a whole bunch of cancers and essentially the take home message is if you have diabetes and cancer, you do worse than if you don't have diabetes. And this graphic basically shows that if you really look at most, this is for breast cancer, if you look at most breast cancer patients, you know, specifically those who are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, they are more likely to die of cardiovascular death, having nothing to do with their cancer than they are from cancer or its late effects. So what, do you, what can you expect of providers? So be aware, they should be aware of the potential late effects. So for primary care providers, they have to have some awareness, but really it's up to the oncologist to provide the information. Um, they should ask you about your prior cancer history and what type of cancer treatment you received. At least ask the questions of, do you know what you had? What kind of treatment did you have? They need to have an early recognition of symptoms and they need to be able to refer you to appropriate care as, as I mentioned before. And what can you do? So again, be aware of the treatment that you had and talk to your providers about what you may expect. Pay attention to areas of radiation exposure, especially if it's been more than 10 years after. Discuss symptoms with your providers and seek additional input. So there's lots of online resources, as Jay mentioned in his talk, support groups, as you get from um, uh, Cancer Journeys, and specialized survivorship clinics. And so Yale has a clinic, Dana-Farber has a clinic, so we can see patients for a consultative visit, create that survivorship care plan that Jay talked about, and give you some education. Um, So really, um, this is actually, I'll mention this. There is a website on the American Cancer Society uh, website, which is called the Cancer Survivor Network. And it's sort of an interesting kind of um, online support group for patients who have a variety of symptoms. And sometimes I kind of go through this just to kind of make sure that, you know, there's, you know, some of the things that I'm seeing in my practice is what patients are reporting. And there's pretty good consistency there. But on the other hand, I think that while patients do suffer late effects, um, once cancer treatment is done for, which is the rocky road over there, you know, for most patients, you know, you, you, you do want and you do expect kind of a, a more calm, peaceful, serene existence. And for most patients, it is possible. And so one of the things that I want to come out from this talk is even though I've given you all of this scary information, you need to know that this is just information and education. Many patients, again, do not experience any late effects. And so, but information is power. And so as long as you have this information, you will not ignore your symptoms and not realize that you're having shortness of breath because 
you know, you might have been exposed to treatment um, that has led to this. And then I will conclude by saying that, <laughs> that whatever treatment you got, you are here because of it. And if you didn't get the treatment that you, that you had, you wouldn't be sitting here in this audience. And so there's nothing much you can do about the treatment that you already received. But what can you do is that. And what you can do is do your very best to make sure that you are as healthy as you can be so that you don't get the general population stuff and all of the craziness that patients who are not cancer survivors have but that you really focus on keeping yourself as healthy as you possibly can because that is in your hands. So thank you.